the difference with this book is that a lot of it is um, things that I wouldn't have been confident enough to write about in the past and the previous um, book that I did was, was probably a little more statistical and a little bit more about horses and racing, there's a bit more a lot more personal stuff in here, a lot more things about that I, I as I said I'd sp I spoke about a lot of different things in this to do with my racing and riding career um, that I probably wouldn't have been confident enough to talk about in the past. Um, so, and a lot of things have happened, you know, in the last eight or ten years, you know, obviously um, last year probably the most significant winning the Grand National and Sports Personality of the Year and then golf with Tiger Woods and different things that, you know, there was a lot of things happened in 2010 that, you know, that you could only dream of happening. You mentioned Tiger Woods. Mm. Uh, obviously, that obviously meant something to you, playing golf with Tiger Woods. Yeah, you know, it was an amazing experience. Um, you know, he, he couldn't have been a better company, um, total gentleman and, you know, if you ask any young sports person that, you know, that plays golf or whatever, what, you know, what would one of their ambitions in life would be and, and obviously he's had his ups and downs recently but, you know, it, you know, the name that would still come first to your lips is Tiger Woods and, um, Thankfully, through my boss JP McManus and his his wonderful charity golf tournament that he had last year in Ireland, that you know I was able to, to do that to play golf with him. You're not. I heard you talking on the morning line and saying you know you're not from a racing background. It's not in your blood as such. Um, hard to ask you, I suppose. But what do you put your skills in the saddle down to then, if it's not um, in your blood? I don't know. I think as time goes on and, and um, the more you're involved in something, the more things you pick up and you try and learn the difference obviously between right and wrong. And, and I just think that I was very lucky that I went to very good teachers um, early on in my life. Very, you know, Obviously I didn't spend very long in school, but I felt my education was um, uh, was complete it really with the, the people that I ended up working with, um, i.e. Billy Rock to start with and Jim Bulger and through to Toby Balding, Martin Pipe, John Junior and JP McManus, you know, it, you know, if I was to set out someone's life that this is the way they were gonna be then, you know, that would that would be the route I'd I'd choose to send someone, you know. If we're lucky in our jobs and careers, they're, they're, for a lot of people there comes a point when you you think, Yes, I can do this job and I can do it well. When do you think that dawned on you? Do you know, I, I always, I think in any walk of life or in any sport, I think you have to believe in yourself. You have to have belief because if, if you don't, then no one else will. And I, there's, you know, there's a huge difference between an arrogant, someone who's arrogant and someone who's got bad belief. I, I always felt that from a very young age that I had belief in myself. Um, and it wasn't one moment, one, uh, not, not later on, one, you know where you thought yes. Not 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 really. But as a jump jockey, the the great thing about the, the the sport is that you're never in any position to get ahead of yourself or think that you're above it or better than it. Because, um, you know, I keep pointing out it's one of the very few things in life that the only thing behind you is the ambulance. And um, I've ended up in it enough times to realise that I ain't unbreakable or I ain't invincible. I've had a lot of injuries. But at the same time, I see it as part of the job, and you know, you you got to take risks to to, to make things happen. And, um, when you do the, take the risks, sometimes the the calculations aren't as good as you'd hoped they were, and right. and, and things happen. But um, you you, know. you say in the book you talk about when the the Martin Pipe job came up that it was the most sought after, I think, for your words, um, yeah. job. So. Moving, I mean, and you had such great success with Martin Pipe. I have to ask you, why did you leave that job? Because you know what, the everything. Um, I I was at a point in my life when I, I I rode for Martin Pipe for seven years, and he, he in my opinion, totally um, changed the art of training a racehorse, um, especially a jump racehorse. And you know his his. The prolific number of winners that he had at that time showed that. Um, I rode for him for seven years, rode nearly 1,200 winners. Um, I rode 100, 189 winners in one season for him. Um, and, and you know, there is always the thing in the back of your mind that people 
you know, and I'm being realistic about it, I think 10 to 15 of the top jump jockeys in the country at that time, if they had ridden for Martin Pipe, would have been champion jockey. It was too easy. It wasn't too easy, but it wasn't too easy because you know, it's never too easy. But you know, there's always there's always the the point in your life where you think that you know that people might not think that well anyone could have done that job. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fact that I, I had great respect and had you know always got on really well with with John Joe O'Neill, and I, I saw it as a different challenge, and obviously. You know, J.P. McManus is um, an owner who has, you know, developed a, a, a good number of horses, and it, it was something that I seen as very much a, a challenge. And um, so it, it was a very difficult, very difficult decision to make, and very difficult time in my life. Yeah, and I, think, I mean, you said something, didn't you? You went home thinking, oh, "What have I done? Have I done the yeah. right thing?" But I, I've never had any regrets in any of the decisions that I've made, and you know I think once you make the decision, you 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 move on and you make the most of it, and you you either sink or swim, and that's yeah. basically the long and the short of it. Sportsmen often say that breaking records doesn't doesn't matter, that just winning the next game, the next race, or whatever. But obviously, breaking St. Gordon Richard's record must mean something to you. Yeah, it did, and and obviously every sports person is different, so you you have different. You know, you have different goals. Um, when I got to a point um, before I broke Sir Gordon Richard's record that that I thought it was possible, then I, I it it became near on an obsession. You know, for a year, year and year out to try and actually d to break that record in my own mind. Obviously, not in you know, I didn't, I didn't ever make anyone else aware of it. But um, it was something that that I. From a few, few of the seasons previous, I knew it was possible, and um, I wanted to give it my all to try and achieve that. Okay. As punters, we watch your many races, we listen in or whatever, and the phrase is, well, we, we've often seen over the years you snatch victory from seemingly the jaws of defeat, and say, how did he do that? And one, obviously, among many, stand out last year at Haydock Park, or 2010, I should say, Haydock Park. Drill sergeant. I yeah. watched it oh, baffled. Explain that to me. I don't know. Yeah, some horses, you know, it, it was different because Jet Drill Sergeant was obviously the best horse in the race, but he, he's had a horse that has had a lot of experience flat racing and, and quite aware of quite aware of the stable yard and where he came out of going around the bend at Headock and he just decided to stop and I mean know. hang on, he, he comes around, I mean it's it's on YouTube for anybody yeah. who wants to watch it, but he you come around, you're ahead and then for some reason he stops. He just went from first to last, yeah, basically. And you either you either trying to bully him into doing it by giving him a smack or a few smacks and thinking I'm gonna make you go or What's your initial action? Or do you think oh, um, shit or what's he doing or uh, uh, my, he was doing I knew what he was doing straight away, yeah. I knew that he was a horse that has been around the block, he knows the score. Me smacking him or beating him wasn't going to change his mind. But well, what's going through the horse's head? He's, he's wanting. Somewhere he's thinking. Else. He's thinking the stable yard is just to the right. What's the point of me going back round again? <laughs> to be fair, he's only thinking if I was in his position, what I'd be thinking as well, <laughs> or that anyone else that's, you know, you know, the, he's just thinking what probably the majority of human beings would be thinking. Okay. Why do I need to run back around there whenever the house that I just came out of is just in there on the right? <laughs> And, and that was basically it, but it was a case of knowing and accepting the fact that it, it wasn't a case to bully him and try and make him go, it was a case of, I knew that he was, you know, I knew it was his train of thought and I, I yeah. took so the chance. So he's still the best horse in the race. So it's yeah, I just back. thought when the others come around him that hopefully he'll, he'll decide how oh, best go ahead and follow the rest of him again, which luckily he did. You, you write, uh, obviously, <coughs> the words picking up a horse comes up, up in the book more than once, <coughs> and it's a phrase we hear often. How do you pick up a horse? Well, you don't, but, you know, you know there's, I, I always say that horses are, should be treated just the way like human beings are. You know, they're all different. You know, they're not all nice, they're not all good, they're not all bad. Okay. Some of them are better than others, some of them try harder than others. And it's basically trying to get to the, the understanding and the understanding of them as best possible, best possible way. And 
some horses you just know by by the way you're riding them that they're either responding or they're not responding. And when you meet a horse for other than what you've been told by the trainer or whatever, yeah. when you meet when you sit on a horse for the first time, yeah. How soon do you know? You, well, you, you you get a feeling from it. You get a you you get a a sense of what's working and what's not working. And if it's not working, then you try different little things to make them work. You know whether you know whether just just be riding them slightly different. You know, so there are you know that you got to treat them all as individuals and treat them all differently. So. But you can look at horse, and I can look at the same horse, and you're going to see something completely different from me. Yeah, and there's a fair chance that I could see and feel some totally different riding than you will see, and uh, you will see from watching it. You know, so, um, and it, it's the great thing about riding in that you know, you will always have opinions in every walk of life, and people watching a racehorse, well, a lot of them will have a different opinion of the person riding it, but <laughs> sometimes the person riding it has a more yeah. inside knowledge to it than the person watching. Usually. So the national, obviously, fifteenth attempt and the day, and don't push it. Uh, yeah. One bit that stands out in the book, uh, in terms of the national, because is you looking before the race at the big screen to see what the odds were. Um, is that normal? Yeah, it, it only became normal, I think, through my time in Martin Pipes, because he was always keen on you being aware of what opposition could be supported in the race and what horses might have been gambled on that suddenly you didn't know about and it was you know so just so you could for that just so course. you could keep an eye on the opposition if one horse that suddenly hadn't got great form and all of a sudden there was a lot of money on it then you know that someone was expecting a big improvement that you were aware that it, it could be a danger you know so we as punters are looking at the odds on the big screen or whatever I'm a I was amazed, I was surprised, I should say, to see that before the Grand National, where, yeah. of course, everybody wants yeah. you to win, you're looking at the odds. Yeah, I, I just, it was just a habit of, you know, and obviously the Grand National is, is a one-off horse race. It's, it's unique for the reasons that everyone knows. And, oh, and, and you know that, realistically, the betting, whether one's been backed or not, is not really going to, to make them run any faster. And when but you it was just up a, that day. It was don't push it. That was being yeah. It was backed. don't don't push it. That was being backed. And um, you know, I, I just thought it, it. It's funny. We all have, you know, we all have have different thoughts. And and um, two weeks before the Grand National, don't push it was fifty to one. You know, and and uh, and you know, there he was, just before the race, going to be favourite. You know, so it's amazing that in two weeks. Suddenly, all of a sudden, someone thought he was going to win, you know, and it, and, it, and it was it was probably your everyday punter, your your maybe once a year punter, who who probably made him favourite, not because he was in better form or that his he'd suddenly grown wings in two weeks, because you know he was he was still in the same condition on Grand National Day as he had been for the previous month, you know. At what point in the race did you think, yes, we could win this? He he's always been a very talented horse, um, if a little quirky, and I, I just got a, a, a feeling from a very early stage that he was enjoying what he was doing, and he was the sort of horse that, if he was enjoying what he was doing, he was more than capable of of winning, you know. So, uh, you know, probably from from after five or six fences, i.e., probably over Beecher's Brook, uh, the fourth time was probably when I thought this horse, this horse is liking what he's doing, you know. But in that moment of exhilaration, I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but it does take a while f to sink in. Yeah, very much so. I, I didn't sleep on, on the Saturday night with the adrenaline, you know, and it was purely adrenaline, you know, that was, and I'm the best sleeper in the world, but I, it, it was, you know, I said it, breaking Sir Gordon Richards' record was the greatest achievement that I've ever had in racing, but the greatest day in racing was definitely winning the Grand National. One of your favourite horses, certainly my favourite that in recent years that you rode was Richard Uh what, I mean, you've, you've you've said I think elsewhere that you felt it was what underrated that horse. Yeah, yeah, not that he was underrated because he, you know, he wasn't the best horse, um, but what he had was an unbelievable will to win, and obviously I got a lot of accolades for my ride of winning on him at Cheltenham, um, which was fantastic. But I. I kind of felt uh, uh, that, that the horse never got the credit that he deserved, you know, and um, 
he's just an amazing will to win and an amazing heart and just a very likeable horse and um, you know he won twice in him at the Sheldon Festival and unfortunately he got tragically yeah. killed in the Irish Grand National and uh, I watched that day and I remember watching mm. and thinking oh it's all right it's getting up and yeah. then he he, he fell he fell and the horse behind him hit him and basically you know uh, um, and the way you talk about it in the book got very emotional. Injured. yeah it was very emotional you know because he was a horse that had given me one of my greatest days in racing you know and um, he won twice at the Cheltenham Festival and um, you know those horses that are willing you know that you know he he he, he gave you everything you know he was um, as, as I said he was if he was if he was a human being or a boxer you wouldn't have wanted to get into the ring with him you know because he might not have been technically the best but certainly he was probably the bravest you know I've probably been guilty in years gone by when I was in that situation, watching those situations with you, whereby you you walk in the ambulance, whatever, in the car straight straight away, and uh, I don't know. In years gone by, I might have thought, bloody hell, that's you know heartless or whatever, just walking off straight away and the horse is dying. Yeah. But obviously, I've read your book now, and the way you talk about it, you you, you don't want to be there. You need to get out of there. You need to get out of there. You don't. You don't want to see the big screens going around and, and a horse being humanly d destroyed. You know, it's especially one that you've ridden, and that's not necessarily just saying the good ones as well. I I can't I can't watch any horse that I've ridden being, you being had tragically Richard destroyed. And Glorious Victors. Yeah, you talk yeah. about in great detail. And I, you say you cried. You know, yeah, you know terrible things that happen, and uh, as I said, even the lesser horses that it's happened to, I I can't I can't watch it happening. You know, tragedy happens in every walk of life. It's not just an horse racing, you know. So. But with Wichita, it was the thing that but, but, the horse was fine. He was getting up, and then. Yeah, you know, I, I thought he was going to be okay. You know, I knew from the noise that he was making, and the, when he tried to get up, the, the groans, and I, and I kind of remember sitting on his head to make sure he didn't try and get up because I thought he was going to cause himself more pain. And once I had a vet there and that, I just wanted to get out of there, you know. And, uh, I didn't. I didn't want to hear any noises or you know okay. so. And because we then see the jockey come back out in different colours for the next race or whatever, we think, bloody hell, they don't, but jockeys do care. Yeah, I think the, what, what people tend to forget is that not only jockeys, but the stable lads that look after the horses, the trainer, the owner, um, you know, they, they, their horse becomes their life, you know. You know, the girl that looked after which at alignment, you know, well, he was her life, you know, and even though, I only rode him and, and saw him, you know, yeah. not as frequently as what she did. Um, you, you you get involved in horse racing and horses because you love them growing up as a kid, and they're what you want to get in. You know, they're they're what they're what they're what make you happy. They are what, they are basically what makes you happy. You know. Reading the psychology of some of your earlier days or whatever, it struck me. It struck me that just like I don't know some of us punters. Um, like yesterday, you know, seven winners. I selected seven winners the day before. Seven winners. It's always the eighth that got away that nags at me day in, day out for a week to come. Clearly, on the jockey front, you were like that for a while. And yeah. what is it about this great sport that does that to us? Be because if you're lucky enough to have a good run where you win um, quite a lot, then you want to win all the time. And unfortunately, in life, in sport, that is not possible. Um, but trying to get that to register in your head sometimes is not very easy and you know you can ride two or three or four winners in a day whatever it may be but if you're after having five or six rides and a couple of them got beat or one of them fell that might have won then much in all as you enjoy the other winners mm -hmm. the one that that fell or that didn't win when you go home is the one that's going to bug you it's the one that you'll think about most of the night <laughs> because it could have been one more yeah. And then it could have been a really good day. If there was one most important thing that a punter should look for in a in a given race or horse, um, what do you think? No, it's it's you know it, 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 I say it can be a number of things. You know, the, you know, the, obviously the going is very important to some horses. Is it the most important thing in a race? The going. It's not the most important thing because because a lot of people will tell you that that the very best horses probably go on most goings, and it's probably true. But but you're talking with the exception of the very best. 
you know, because the very best of the very best, because they always find a way to win, you know, and that's where they are, where they are. Um, on a daily basis, the ground can be very important. Um, obviously, the look and the fitness of the horse is obviously very important. And the, the form, the trainer form, the jockey form, I'm not sure that it is so important because at some point it's going to become irrelevant or it's going to become, you know, there are going to be, they are going to hit form and they're going to lose form, you know, so, you know, you could back at the day it's going to lose form, the trainer's going to lose form, you could back at the day it's going to hit form, you know, so. When you get on a horse, I mean, how often at the start of a race you get on a horse, do you, do you, you know this is a good and this? Um, or, or, or conversely, how often do you get on a horse uh, and you know, no matter what you do, this isn't going to... You see, they're all different. You get great reports from horses at home that are flying up the gallops and they beat every horse on sight and they go racing and they just disappoint. And you get the complete opposite. The horse that, that doesn't impress everyone at home, that's lazy and looks slow and comes to the races and just turns inside out. And, and um, you, you do get a lot, of, you do get a lot of, of very good horses that are like that, 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 that save their best for, for, for the races. Um, uh, have there been horses that you've been on that have taken you by surprise? Uh, how good they are? Well, yeah, yeah. You know, we've had a few along the way. Um, as I said, some are not always the, the greatest work horses. Um, Binocular is a horse that, you know, he's always had his problems, but he's never been a really good work horse. And um, so there are times, as I said, when you go to races and, and you get disappointed because the, the morning glory horses, they call them disappoints and 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 their days when you go and the lazy slow one turns into a champion. You were one of the first, if memory serves me right, if not the first jockey on Twitter, um, all those many months ago. Mm. Um, and I think it's good that racing and racing people seem to be using it and have used it to a positive effect rather than some of the yeah. debates that have gone on in football. Were you aware of the massive Twitter campaign re-sports personality of the world? Um, not, not really, but um, Claire Balding is a pretty good friend of, yes. of mine and to be fair she made me very much aware of it and um, it was probably through her persuasion that I decided to join Twitter and um, look it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great concept, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way of, of um, Communicating with people, and you know, and you do, and you do it, you do that. You know, you the word well. the word can spread very, very quickly. Um, obviously, some people use it differently than others, and some people like to tell you when they've made a cup of tea. Yeah. Um, but I was amazed coming which, up to BBC Sports Personality Year when obviously racing. Mm. Those who love racing are always sick of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it was amazing the campaign on Twitter to, yeah. to let's get AP. Yeah, it was it was amazing and and you know th that wouldn't have happened obviously without the public that were kind enough to to make all those phone calls both in and within and without of racing. You know um, that wouldn't have happened as I said. So and I see you cheated at the awards. You you knew before I did watching at home on telly that you'd won. It. Yeah, yeah. I um I was sat in front of and it came up in the it came up in the. Autocube. On the auto queue beforehand. Um, so you see, you worked in telly so often. So you need to look at the auto queue. Well, it was parked right in front of me, and it, and it said the winner is. Of, I, I was struggling not to read it. I, I did feel a little hopeful that you know, I wasn't aware that any of the other um, ten nominees were Arsenal fans. But I, 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 I was pretty pleased when I saw Cesc Fabregas coming out. You know, because I, I thought that, you know, if there had been two or three other. Arsenal fans in the in the lineup, I'd have been disappointed. Why Arsenal? Uh, I think when I was a kid growing up, for some reason, probably even before my earliest memories, I got a, I I, I got a bit of a fixation with with Liam Brady and Pat Jennings and Frank Stapleton. There was a like Pat Rice. There was quite a lot of Irish footballers there at the time, and um, for some reason, I I I, I think. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was an FA Cup final on. I think it might have been the '79 or '80 Cup final that Arsenal won. I, c I can remember my mother telling me I had to get a yellow Arsenal strip afterwards because I think they won. And I think they played in the away. I think it was they the, did. the yellow away oh, strip. Yeah, 
and um, I wanted the yellow away strip, which I, you know, I'm, I, my mother very kindly got me, you know, so. Um, and Chippy Brady was, Liam Brady was your Liam, first footballing hero? Or? Liam Brady, yeah. Um, you know, and then because obviously he played for Ireland as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, as himself and Pat Jennings were the, the, the main reasons that, um, that I support Arsenal. Are you a passive fan in the stand? Do you shout and swear? Do you... A little bit, yeah. I'm a bit disappointed to say I'm quite rowdy whenever it happens. Um, but I, I'm lucky enough to get to the Emirates quite a lot. And uh, Favourite Arsenal moment that you've seen? Um, we've, we, we've had a few, I, I suppose. The, the, the 2004 campaign when they went unbeaten is, you know, has been an amazing achievement. One of the th great memories, I think, is Martin Keown jumping up on the road Van Nistelrooy whenever he missed the penalty. Um, Favourite match or...? Um, no, no, I think... As a, as a somebody who's in another sport, so... You're yeah, well. I, my disappointing match, I went to the, the cup final in, in the Stade of France, the Champions League final, and um, obviously uh, Jens Lehmann got sent off, I think mm. it was, yeah. That was probably my, my, my most disappointing match. Um, Your favourite match or the one you got most excited over? My favourite match actually was probably actually last year, watching them beat Barcelona at, at, at the Emirates. It was an amazing match to watch. Um, my favourite goal, I think, probably Dennis Burkamp's flick when he got beat Newcastle and he flicked it round. You know, I thought, you know, it takes a special footballer to be able to do that. Frankly, I didn't understand the need for a change on the rules on the bit. Um, what was I missing? Was there, there wasn't a problem to be solved, or am I right? Um, look, we kept hearing from the BHA that there was a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of welfare issues with the with the use of the whip from different bodies around the world, around the country, whether it be animal welfare, racing, or animal welfare, or RSPCA, or whatever it may be. So I presume there was reasons for making the changes. But hang on, you're a jockey. Were there reasons for, for, from the jockey's perspective? Um, Does anybody in the, the, not, the, not, the jockey say, well, I tell you what, we must... Not everyone's ever going to agree with, with the rules that a governing body bring into any sport. Um, they obviously had pressure from somewhere to, to make changes. Uh, it's pretty obvious that everyone could have done things a lot better than that were done. If you were to ask for suggestions, I think that the old rules were probably fine and maybe make the penalties much stronger, maybe make the penalties to make sure that no one ever broke them. Um, were there well, jockeys, I mean, were there jockeys who persistently, I don't speak to name names, obviously, were there jockeys who persistently used the whip too often, to your mind? Well, there were certain high profile races that, 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 they, that they thought brought, uh, that, that the wrong, <coughs> that brought the wrong attention to the sport. And um, as I said, those few, Major races that that uh, those, those occurred, and it might have been better to to give the jockeys much severe penalties. And I suppose what they were trying to get away from was that jockeys winning at all costs and not n not thinking about the welfare of the horse, um, yeah. which I don't ever think was an issue. But what has become quite difficult is obviously the number of times has been halved, and the penalties have been doubled. So. Because um, now we approach deepest winter with mud and three, yeah. mile, three mile races and this, that and the other. Are there, to your mind, are there jockeys who under the new regulations have only eight uses of a bit? Are there jockeys who have won races who will never win a race again because of this rule? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I would hope not. Um, but, it, 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 you know, the, I, I think I just keep making the point that all horses are different and all races are different. and. You know, there should have been a little bit more discretion left to the jockey um, and to the stewards on the day, you know, as to whether they thought something was being abusive or not. Um, so. And are there horses? No, this is fine, really. Yeah, sort of, yeah. And feel free to name these yeah, yeah. for all punters yeah. watching. Are there horses you know of with history of winning who now, under new rules, will not win another race? Yeah, there are a few. Um, would you care to name them, Mr. McLeod? Uh, I wouldn't be as uh, shameful to, to name some per owner's horse that might not win again. But 
I did win him one last year at, at the at, 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 at me, at the entry in, in May of Nigel Twist and Davis's and um, I met the owners in Carlisle um, about a month ago and I said to them, I said, lads, I hate to disappoint you before you're going out, I said, but he's going to find it very difficult to win um, with the way the new rules are, I said, because, you know, he was just a very lazy type of horse, but at the same time, um, he just needed motivating, you know, it wasn't the, the case of you know, bullying him into something that he didn't want to do. When you got him motivated, he did do it. Um, and I think that he was going to take full advantage to the way the new rules are. And I think he's run a couple of times since and been a bit disappointed. But hopefully, hopefully that for their sake, they'll persevere and he might get back on a winning trail at some point. I mean, it might have, might it not have the opposite effect of what everybody wanted. I, I'm worried that in the winter, deepest winter, that a horse, there's going to be a fatality because a jockey isn't able to use the whip at a certain point or is shy of doing something. Well, you always worry about the health and safety of the sport and, and you know, that should have been maybe taken into consideration a little bit more that it is, it is used for motivation and, as I said, horses can be like humans and some need... Do you think, do you some think need a horse could die this winter because they I hope, can't use I, the whip? I hope not, but it's, it's possible. And the whip, that's, you know, I know that's been discussed. It's the wrong name. It's the wrong name. Uh, we'd, awesome. love, we'd love someone to come up with a better name because... I'm looking at the man. Come it's not like... Come up with a, come up with a it's, not like a, it's not like the, the instrument that was used 20 years ago. It's now an air-cushioned, very horse-friendly um, um, thing that, that, that makes as much noise as, as does anything else, you know. And if I ask the members who watch this, interview to come up with a name and uh, if on one day one of your least busiest moments yeah. I just tweet you three of the best that would be would brilliant would you be willing to pick one yeah, for we'll, the we'll, prize we'll, for the book yeah we'll pick one and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully we can get it out there and hopefully yeah. someone might start using it instead of the whip thank you very much AP thank you All for right. your time